to Nuked Radio. Today is Tuesday, May the 1st. This is episode number 27. And today is May Day, which is an ancient Northern Hemisphere Spring Festival Day. And usually a traditional spring holiday in many countries. This is something that's celebrated a little bit more in Europe. I believe they also call it International Workers Day. This day also has some significance because it's being heavily promoted by the Occupy movement as a month to begin our serious protesting. And there are a couple of uh, news stories on this already. In fact, YouTube um, has some, some videos posted of some May Day protests that are off to a bit of a slow start in New York City because it's raining there today. Uh, but there was also a mention of some banks that received some envelopes with white powder, which was found to be cornstarch. Um, one of the things that we need to talk about today because of May Day and because of some comments that were made this weekend by Ron Paul is rumors versus facts and false flags and psyops and what all those things mean in terms of our government, very interesting article published today in the New York Times, all foil terrorist plots were actually hatched by the FBI. The United States has been narrowly saved from lethal terrorist plots in recent years, or so it seemed. A would-be suicide bomber was intercepted on his way to the Capitol. A scheme to bomb synagogues and shoot stinger missiles at military aircraft was developed by men in Newburgh, New York, and a fanciful idea to fly explosive-laden model planes into the Pentagon and the Capitol was hatched in Massachusetts. But all these dramas were facilitated by the FBI, whose undercover agents and informers posed as terrorists offering a dummy missile, fake C-4 explosives, a disarmed suicide vest, and rudimentary training. Suspects naively played their parts until they were arrested. I'm going to encourage you to read this article in its entirety, and I'll post a link in chat. With me today is Jules, and we also brought in Popeye to help break down some of these things for us. Hi, Christina. How are you today? Hi, guys. Tired. <laughs> yeah, me too. You sound beat. You know, it's, um, I, it's a good position to be in. I am beat only because I have been getting hundreds of emails from people who have either read the article on End the Lie, which I think we're up to like a couple hundred thousand now, or they saw one of the mutation videos that I posted from last week. I think the numbers are up to like 25,000. And we also created a new mutation blog. We created a mutation blog on Tumblr, and what we're going to do is as I put these documents and, and photos into folders for researchers. We're going to put them on the web so people can actually copy them and, and use them or other researchers can use them um, that we may not uh, know of. And so we'll promote this uh, the site and the feed will also go into Mutation Watch on Facebook. And I'll tie it to FukushimaFacts.com also. I haven't done that yet, but I will. Yeah, I'm, I'm really um, overwhelmed by the response, but it's a very good position to be in. And I encourage people to keep sending the pictures. And I'm going to enlist the help of some people probably today to help me organize that so we can get it out as fast as possible. Also, we've had some emails and some conversations from a few people who have some IT uh, experience about some of our hacking problems that we've had. And I'm not going to share that information with you guys, <laughs> what they told us to do, but it was all very good advice. And I guess over the weekend, there were a few other uh, people who um, either had their signals jammed or were taken off the air. You know, Project Camelot was one. And then some hosts from Orion have had some problems getting into their email. I had that problem this weekend myself. Unfortunately, but um, it seems to be straightened out now. So, I mean, it is an, a nuisance, uh, but we always seem to find a way to work around it, and we will continue to do so. There was a story that came out late last week. I wasn't planning on covering this story, but in light of some recent comments from Ron Paul, I thought maybe it's a good idea that we talk about it, um, if for any reason, to discourage it from happening if it's true. There's going to be this big NATO summit in Chicago on the weekend of May 20th. 
My understanding is that they're going to be meeting at McCormick Place in downtown Chicago for the first couple of days, and then the uh, the people are going to be moving to Camp David to continue their talks. Chicago is expecting widespread protests because of this NATO summit. Late last week, there was a police officer that called into another network that said Hazmat was planning or preparing for a nuclear event. This gentleman didn't know if it was something that would originate from a nuke plant or if it was some type of dirty bomb, possibly. Or, of course, there's always that possibility that Chicago is trying to discourage people from coming to the city to protest, so they put these rumors out there. I mean, you just never know. Another interview, though, and this has been a pretty hot topic online, was that uh, there have been some construction devices that use a cesium chip that have been going missing over the last several months. And this was a um, FBI informant that called into another radio show over the weekend and said that the FBI thinks there may be a dirty bomb that has been built. And I'm going to try to confirm these missing construction devices through the NRC event notification page today because as I go through those, when I do the forecast and the nuke reports, Anything that has radioactive material that shows up missing is usually on there. And I've noticed a few times that exit signs have been reported as missing from certain facilities. They have uh, some type of radioactive material in them. Of course, smoke detectors do also. And then these construction cameras. The most recent one that I recall was in Denver from a guy that was doing surveys on an oil pipeline who forgot to secure the camera properly on his truck when he drove off and it fell off the truck and they later recovered it. There's been some other stories where they've gone missing from army bases. So I'm going to put together a list of those things that I'll post on Ratchet later today and maybe we'll run through that list on Thursday. So is this a sign to keep people away from Chicago? I don't know, but what really piqued my interest was Ron Paul was in Dallas last Friday and he mentioned false flags. Talk about non-intervention and minding our own business. Say, like, oh, you guys are a bunch of isolationists. You don't want to talk to anybody. But guess what? The very people who tell us that we're the isolationists are the ones who are always looking around for another enemy to slay and put on sanctions and start another war. They're the ones who don't want to trade with Cuba. We're the ones that think that it's time to engage in the world and to talk to people and trade with people. So they will try to paint us as uncaring. But let me tell you, people who care will care about liberty. And uh, this this will never translate into an absolute majority. But I, I am I'm certain that our numbers are growing by leaps and bounds. These prairie fires of uh, freedom are being spread, and there's nothing but good news out there, precariously so, because we don't know exactly. We may have something happen. There may be a false flag uh, incident where some some uh, ship goes down and you be used for the excuse to accelerate the next war. And... Um, we have to learn to distinguish war propaganda from the truth. I think he's right on target. 110%. Yeah, after when he was leaving the stage, there was a, a reporter that stopped him and asked him if he had heard anything about the Chicago event. But uh, I don't know exactly what's behind all that. But uh, uh, that kind of no, those kind of those kind of statements concern me. Could there be potentially another false flag event? I'm always worried about false flag events. There you go. He just said, "I'm always worried about false flag events." Shocking. You know, I I hope nothing happens to this guy. I really do. And I felt that way about him for a while because of. Um, the information that, that he gives out could be very damaging to the way politics are done in Washington and the corruption that is so prevalent. Um, he is a physician, and he is usually right on target with the things that he talks about. I'd like to hear him 
uh, who get asked about 9-11. So a false flag, by definition, also called a black flag, are operations that are covert, which are desi designed to deceive in such a way that the operations appear as though they are being carried out by other entities. The name is derived from the military concept of flying false colors, that is, flying the flag of a country other than, than one's own. False flag operations are not limited to war and counterinsurgency operations and can be used during peacetime. British privateers used to do it. They used to literally fall, uh, fly a false flag. It comes from the naval battles hundreds of years ago. You would come up, uh, the British privateers, right? They, these were the paid pirates. They wanted to come up upon a ship, but they didn't want the French ship to know that they were British because then they would know they were enemy. So they would, mm -hmm. they would fly up flying a French flag. And then as soon as they got close, they would drop the French flag and up would go the British flag or in some cases up would go the Jolly Roger, depending on who it was. And that's how they would sneak up on them. They would pretty much get them to let their guard down until they were close enough that it was too late. And then as soon as they uh, changed flags, they would bombard them with a you know, cannon fire and they would have their guys swing over and uh, board the ship. And that's where the term false flag, you're 100% correct. That's where the, uh, the term comes from. Kind of like what we did with the Boston Tea Party was almost a, a kind of a false flag. They dressed up as Indians and pretended to be Indians raiding the, the ships and throwing the tea overboard. They didn't just go down there as pissed off colonists and do it. They dressed up like Indians. That's kind of a false flag. You're pretending to be somebody else doing something. Another thing that kind of falls under that heading is um, psyops or psychological operations, which are planned operations to convey selected information and indicators to foreign audiences to influence their emotions, motives, objective reasoning, and ultimately the behavior of foreign governments, organizations, groups, and individuals. The purpose of the U.S. psychological operations is to induce or reinforce behavior favorable to U.S. objectives. They are an important part of the range of diplomatic, informational, military, and economic activities available to the U.S. They can be utilized during both peacetime and conflict. And there are three main types, strategic, operational, and tactical. You know, these are all things that I, I never knew about until I started looking into Fukushima. And when, when people start researching Fukushima, it kind of opens the door to a lot of other things Tactical PSYOPs are conducted in an area assigned to a tacti tactical commander across the range of military operations to support the missions against opposing forces. But they can be used also on the, their own population. So a lot of stuff going on, and I don't usually cover political things on this show. I try to stay away from it because there's so many hosts on Orion that are, are much better at breaking this down than I am. But I thought it was important that we cover in light of all these things. And one thing that's really important to keep in mind, too, with all these different players and things going on, is when it comes to Fukushima, the government is basically protecting the nuke industry. And we've talked about before how they are able to um, use the plutonium that's generated from all these reactors to make bombs. It's a billion-dollar industry. And you better believe that they're going to do a PR campaign, what's also called shilling, where they use tactical people, sometimes retired nuclear industry people, to actually go online and comment on articles and make the people that are talking about some of this stuff look stupid. And it gets pretty obvious, and I saw a lot of it going on right after Fukushima happened. It seemed to have dropped off a bit since then. But every once in a while where you really see this happening is on some of the mainstream networks like Huffington Post is notorious for having shills commenting on their articles. Another rumor versus fact, which I've kind of stayed away from, but I received an email last night that I want to share with you guys is the possibility that Japan is going to be evacuating to the Corel Islands. And there was a European Union Times article about two weeks ago regarding this issue. This is the email that I got about it, and this is from a source that I trust. When I first saw this, I dismissed it as disinfo, given the source, which had been outed to me 
by a dependable associate. However, I received a private email last week from one of the people I work with who is a liaison with top-level Japanese who are working around the remediation issues at Fukushima. He, in turn, has now heard from a Japanese medical researcher whose specialty is energy medicine that this information is, unfortunately, closer to the truth than any official wants to admit. I was stunned to hear this from someone who has always erred on the side of moderation, so I'm passing it on for what it is worth, and I'd like to just share a portion of this article. Some of you may recall this. Russia stunned after Japanese plan to evacuate 40 million revealed, and we'll get back to that article when we come back from the break. You're listening to Food Radio. read some of this article from the European Union Times. A new report circulating in the Kremlin prepared by the foreign ministry on the planned reopening of talks with Japan over the disputed Kurel Islands during the next fortnight states that Russian diplomats were stunned after being told by their Japanese counterparts that upwards of 40 million of their people were in extreme danger of life-threatening radiation poisoning and could very well likely be faced with forced evacuations from their country's easternmost located cities, including the world's largest one, Tokyo. The Corral Islands are located in Russia's Oblast region and stretch approximately 1,300 kilometers northeast from Hokkaido, Japan, to Kamchatka, Russia, separating the Sea of Ohotsk from the North Pacific Ocean. And they have earthquakes there all the time, too. There are 56 islands and many more minor rocks. It consists of Greater Corral Ridge and Lesser Corral Ridge, all of which were captured by Soviet forces in the closing days of World War II from the Japanese. The extreme danger facing tens of millions of the Japanese people is the result of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster that was a series of equipment failures, nuclear meltdowns, and releases of radioactive materials following the Tohoku earthquake and tsunami. According to this report, Japanese diplomats have signaled to their Russian counterparts that the return of the Corral Islands to Japan is critical, as they have no other place to resettle so many people that would, in essence, become the largest migration of human beings since the 1930s, when Soviet leader Stalin forced tens of millions to resettle Russia's far eastern regions. I've also heard that there were discussions about possibly relocating people from Tokyo to some cities in China that were empty, Um, I'm not sure why those cities were built or why they are empty now, but they're going to need to do something. And and the more that comes out about the spent fuel pool, number four, in fact, there was a video that I saw over the weekend where some engineers went into the reactor building and they showed the bottom and and one of the sides of the um, reinforcements that they have installed for this spent fuel pool. And it's basically like concert staging. It's scaffolding. That's what's holding the pool up, that and some jacks underneath it. And as you know, if you've been following this story or listening to the show, that pool already has had its integrity compromised by cracks, and it's had a series of leaks And TEPCO came out yesterday saying that whenever the cooling gets stopped in any one of these pools, they are unable to record the temperature properly, which is a big problem. And I talked about that a little bit in an article that I wrote for End the Lie this past weekend, and I wanted to just share a portion of that with you as well. Uh, Let's see here. In the past 13 months, a lot of what TEPCO has done has failed miserably. For example, the machines brought in too clean, the radioactive water keep breaking because the radiation is so high. The robots that have been sent into the reactor buildings to assess the situation also keep breaking because the radiation is so high. And Japan also had a drone they tried to fly over the site last year to take air measurements above the buildings, which crashed into the roof of Reactor 2, because the radiation is so high. Humans, of course, can't get near the reactors or the corium either. In fact, Arnie Gunderson said that they can't get within 100 feet of it, which is going to be a problem when you try to assess what is happening. It's been estimated to be 30 to 40 feet under the reactors, although this topic has been extensively debated. 
and I've heard anything from it's still in containment till it's a couple hundred feet, and no one really knows, of course, what this corium is doing. And there are three blobs between 100 to 150 tons in size, also reported by Arnie Gunderson, that are, is at a temperature of approximately 3,000 degrees. Of course, no one really knows this precisely, since humans, robots, and cameras can't get near it without dying or breaking. In fact, all TEPCO has seemed to be able to do is keep pouring tons and tons of water on everything and monitor the gauges they have left, which they themselves say are broken when they read too high, or in the case of the spent fuel pool yesterday, um, they don't feel that the measurements are accurate. The only thing that TEPCO really seems to get right is the lying part, which, of course, we've had plenty of experience of with numerous other nuclear accidents in the past. And there were a few things um, in terms of radiation readings that were very alarming that were going up over this past weekend towards the end of last week. In fact, on Thursday, Thursday last week, I had shared an email from someone in Radiation Watch that they've seen in the past few days the highest spikes in the past eight months, some of them even on the East Coast. This weekend, I had a video that was posted on Radchick showing in England 84 times background in rain, and they had some pretty severe storms in Europe this weekend. St. Louis also had very high readings. Potter Blog has put out a couple videos on this on YouTube, and there were some Russian planes that flew over the U.S. last week that reported very high radiation levels in the upper atmosphere. Now, as far as England goes, um, they also had some tornadoes there this weekend, which is pretty unusual. In fact, if you go back and look at the data, there's been so few of them that they actually reported all the way back to 1878. This article appeared in the BBC on April 26. Tornadoes hit rugby and Essex, residents claim. Suspected tornadoes have struck two areas of England, damaging buildings and uprooting trees. Residents in Rugby and Warwickshire said the tornado had ripped a path through properties toppling chimney stacks and knocking down fences. More than 100 miles away, farm buildings were blown down, killing 20 chickens. No one was hurt. Other than that, weather forecasters said there was a small risk of more tornadoes, but I heard that they did have more this weekend, and this is something that we've been following in the U.S. as well. I tried to bring up the NOAA data for the latest U.S. tornado statistics. And the information that, I've, that I have um, in keeping track of this so far in the U.S. this year, and we've had tornadoes every week through the winter. Since January 1st, we've had 653. 322 of those have been confirmed. And I have the NOAA data up right here, and I had just looked back to see what was going on right after Fukushima when the radiation levels were so high. In 2011, April, what they expected to have were 199. What we actually had confirmed was 758 just in April of last year. The year before that, 2010, there was 139 in April. May of last year, there was 326. June, they started to calm down somewhat. But NOAA hasn't updated the stats yet. They have their um, preliminary statistics up, but not the actual sums recorded. And besides Europe having tornadoes, they have also had some very strange weather one thing that we've been trying to pay attention to is if these radiation levels could be causing an increase in storms. Something that I've shared before on here that we've discussed was the Flint Worcester tornado outbreak sequence, which were two tornadoes, one in, that occurred in Flint, Michigan on June 8th of 1953 and the other in Massachusetts on June 9th. They are among the deadliest in U.S. history were caused by the same, same storm system that moved eastward across the nation. The tornadoes were also related together in the public mind because for a brief period, it was debated in the U.S. Congress whether recent atomic bomb testing in the upper atmosphere had caused the tornadoes. Are people looking for something new? When I asked I'm Kevin Blanche about that, it said that, that was the largest atmospheric dust that was ever 
So this article that I'm uh, looking at right now is from nuclearcrimes.org. Fukushima will have an effect on ocean warming, spawning bigger storms. In 1958, strange things started happening in the southern part of the Western Hemisphere. Powerful storms were creating havoc in Central and South America. The 1958 hurricane season was marked by a slightly above normal number of strong storms, with 12 hurricanes, five of them major hurricane status. Also off the coast of Peru, a large number of birds began dying. Scientists linked the deaths to the bad weather. What was causing the bad weather? Some, including Dr. Albert Schweitzer, blamed atom bomb tests. From April to September of 1958, the U.S. blew up nuclear bombs on Bikini and Owetuk atolls in the Pacific, totaling 35,000 kilotons. The bomb dropped on Hiroshima was just 15 kilotons. Two of the 1958 tests were huge hydrogen bomb explosions. The ocean anomaly in the Pacific that was breeding bad weather was later attributed to the El Nino effect. The first episode of El Nino was in 1949, one year after the U.S. carried out three atom bomb tests in the Pacific with a total yield of seven Hiroshima bombs. But how could the nuclear bomb tests affect weather? Dr. Rosalie Bertel, who has extensively studied our atomic age, has speculated that when nuclear fallout lands or becomes inserted in the oceans, it releases heat as hot radioactive gases or as slowly decaying or heating radioactive solids. As surface temperatures in the ocean rise, storm development increases. Much of the radioactive fallout that landed in the oceans from huge Pacific and Soviet bomb tests of the 50s and 60s has given off tremendous amounts of decay heat over the past 50 or more years. Since warmer chemical particles rise to the surface of the water, hot water rises and cold water sinks, Decades of slow radioactive heat decay emitted by huge quantities of fallout have warmed the surface waters of the oceans. We know that about 10% of the energy in a nuclear blast concentrates is radioactive decay heat. So I'll put a link to this in chat for you guys to look over. And this is something that we really need to uh, keep track of. Another item that was sent to me that I think is going to be very important research that is going to be discussed is a meeting in Geneva that is to discuss the catastrophes at Chernobyl and Fukushima. The topics are going to include the actual consequences of the explosions and how governments and international agencies have attempted to cover them up. Among the speakers will be Alexei Yablokov and Alexei Nestorenko, the two surviving authors of the detailed report on Chernobyl. These are very well-respected research scientists. And this meeting is going to start May 11th. I believe it's the 11th, 12th, and 13th. It's in Geneva, Switzerland. They are stating in their press release that the World Health Organization is an accomplice to this cover-up. In fact, according to the agreement signed on May 5th of 1959 between the WHO and IAEA, who is not allowed to disseminate information, undertake research, or provide assistance to populations affected by nuclear accidents without the approval of the IAEA itself, which reports to the UN Security Council. For the past two years, who no longer even has a radiation and health department, you'd think this would be intrinsic to a World Health Organization, but again, this is another organization and is just tied into the nuclear industry which unless you're paying attention to this, you wouldn't know. Model is used to determine doses and risks of ionizing radiation to human health, fails to distinguish between the effects of internal contamination and those of external irradiation, with, as a direct consequence, denial of the morbidity and mortality rates observed among the people who live in contaminated areas. For the one-year anniversary of Fukushima, Arnie Gunderson had gone to Tokyo and taken five random samples from various places around the city, and all of them came back as radioactive waste. Numbers were that high. And we've also had some reports recently of this black dust that they've been finding around Tokyo. And I know the numbers are like 200 and, or 2,800 counts per second. The stuff is so radioactive, they don't know what it is, except it's biological in nature. So they've got some big problems. And if something happens to that pool, they're not going to have time to evacuate Tokyo. And the more attention that gets paid to
to the spent fuel pool, I think the more people are realizing it. And also with some of these recent reports from Arnie Gunderson about the level of contamination, and now word of this cover-up is coming out. Then we have Ron Paul talking about false flags. Plus, we're going into May, which is going to be probably a, a notorious month for protesting. I mean, it's good that all these things are coming together, but there's also the potential for people to get hurt if there are any of these um, demonstrations or, or some type of uh, false flag event that happens in Chicago. You know, there's many ways that are to protest without being in the thick of it, but what I see when I go around to a lot of these sites is that many people are so compelled to stand up for what they believe in because our problems are so severe that, you know, what they say is one of the quotes that I saw is I'd rather die in the street than die on my knees. All you can do really if you live around with these areas is to have a plan if something goes wrong in reality of the uncertainty of the times that we live in. Um, what I have noticed myself and, and some of the other people that I have been talking to from this radio program is that we seem like we are on the verge of something, a change which a lot of people can feel or see coming, and it's up to us as inhabitants of Earth of how this is going to play out. So I will share that weather article, and I also had, and Popeye's got a clip for us too, the plan to evacuate Chicago seems to be picking up steam. The Illinois Department of Transportation is testing an emergency plan to shut off access into and out of downtown Chicago. The plan uses a network of highway security gates that are designed to shut down all traffic coming in and out of Chicago in the event of a terrorist attack. Popeye, do you have that clip for us? Yeah, here, I'll play it for you. All this right. is about secret government plans to evacuate Chicago. Two has learned there may be a secret plan to evacuate Chicago in case of big trouble at the NATO summit next month. The Red Cross in Milwaukee is apparently reaching out to volunteers to help prepare shelters for any Chicagoans who are suddenly relocated. CBS 2's Mike Parker uncovered the story. CBS 2 News has obtained a copy of Milwaukee area Red Cross emails sent out to volunteers. The message suggests a possible plan to evacuate residents of the city of Chicago during the NATO summit. The conference, the email says, may create unrest or another national security incident. The American Red Cross in southeastern Wisconsin has been asked to place a number of shelters on standby in the event of evacuation from Chicago. That surprise disclosure has some folks who live downtown on edge. A little unnerving? Uh, very unnerving. I feel a little bit unsafe. Just a little, maybe a little bit more than a little bit. Um, doesn't make me feel like I want to be in the city during the NATO conference. I'm lost for words because I absolutely have no idea what that entails. According to a Wisconsin Red Cross spokesperson, the evacuation plan is not theirs alone. She told us, our direction has come from the city of Chicago and the Secret Service. However, officials at the Office of Emergency Management and Communication told us tonight the directive did not come from them. The Secret Service did not return our phone calls. The Chicago Red Cross office said only, we are supporting the city in their NATO planning. A union executive who's been training his members in preparation for the summit believes such a plan might be over the top. This could be a lot like Y2K, you know? A lot of hype and a lot of buildup. People will say that was it, you know, not a big deal. The idea of having to evacuate Chicago residents is number one, a scary prospect, which could account for the reluctance to talk about it. Secondly, it's probably also highly unlikely. This seems to be a case of officials wanting every possible contingency plan on the table. I don't know about that. See, this guy's just, this is the newscaster at the end. He's trying to, you know, sugarcoat it. Now, let's not mention the word martial law or anything like that. Let, let's not even talk about that. Yeah. And what happens, what happens if something happens and this is, you know, while this is going on and just like drills, they go live. You never know. They have information that we don't. So what do they know that we don't? Is there going to be something happening? Is there not? Is it all just to scare the crap out of everybody? Yeah, and, you know, I, I, I thought about, too, about discussing it on the show. You know, I, I felt that was important in light of Ron Paul saying that if there was some discussion about this, 
that it would be very concerning to him for him to make that kind of a statement. I took that seriously because I do respect what he has to say. I appreciate you joining us today, Popeye, and uh, thanks for playing the clips for us. Thank you, Jules. Check out also the growing outrage over a Washington Post editorial that downplays the catastrophe of Fukushima. Thousands are suffering and countless more will die as a result of exposure. Contamination is widespread and growing. The Washington Post editorial board proclaimed in a lead editorial that it was non-catastrophic. So feel free to go to that website and comment on that article. And everybody stay safe. We will be back Thursday. Happy May Day.